early detection of faults, and diagnosis of potential failures. Um, this is the second in our series of, on predictive maintenance. Um, can you go to the next slide, please? Just a, a quick note um, that as our presenters are sharing today, the slides you're about to see are subject to change and APB does not assume responsibility for any incidentals or errors that may arise uh, from scenarios described in today's presentation. Next slide. Just a little housekeeping before we get started so that you know how to participate in today's event. Um, we've taken a screenshot of an example of the attendee interface. You should see something that looks like this. Uh, on your computer desktop, the control panel hides automatically when it's not in use. So you'll have to pull it up, move your cursor to bring it back. You have the opportunity to submit text questions to today's presenters by typing your questions into the Q&A box of your attendee interface. You may send in your questions at any time during the presentation, which will be lasting approximately 30 to 35 minutes today, and we'll collect all of those questions and address them at the end of the presentation during hopefully a very lively Q&A. Um, again, if you can't locate that box in your meeting controls, click on the controls button with the three dots and then click Q&A. This adds the Q&A box so you can type in any of your questions. And also throughout the presentation, we will be having a few quick polls where we'd like you to participate alongside with us. And uh, all, one last reminder is that all of you are on mute. So today's pres and today's presentation is being recorded and we will provide that to you uh, very shortly after uh, the conclusion today. Next slide, please. And today I'm very happy to introduce you to our speakers. So you're hearing from me right now. My name is Samantha Spano and I'm uh, Global Product Marketing Manager for ABB's Digital Solutions. You'll also hear from Peter Dahmer. Damer, he's our Solution Architect for Asset Performance Management, and Connell Brown, he's our Technical Consultant for Integrity Management. And so now I'll pass it over to Peter to get us started. Thanks, Sam. Can you hear me okay? Yes. Excellent. Well, hello, everyone. Uh, yep, my name is Peter, and I'm looking forward to this presentation because this month, I was supposed to be presenting the, the content of this as a, uh, a conference paper in Manchester in the UK. But for whatever reason, I can't travel. I don't think any of us can travel. So um, this is definitely the second best. So it's the second part of uh, two presentations we're making, which are looking at asset performance and maintenance. And my part today is specifically looking at how can we start using innovative techniques to really get into data that represents how an equipment is performing that can give us indication of early failures. So long before the failure can happen, there will be certain signatures, certain things happening that previously we never would have been able to measure. Even if we could measure them, we wouldn't really been able to understand that what those measurements were showing us was something's beginning to go wrong. Um, so I'm definitely going to be talking about maths. So, or sorry, most of the audience, North American, what you would call math. We actually have plural maths in English, English. So I'm certainly going to be talking about a mathematical subject, but don't worry, there are no formulae that I'm going to be showing. Um, so really, I am hope I'm going to be able to demystify some of the world of statistics and machine learning and, and machine algorithms for you, um, specifically to do with early detection of failure in industrial equipment. But as you'll see in the next slide, actually quite a, a sort of general subject when it comes to any field of science or engineering or technology, whether it be medicine, transport, economics, so the, the principles I'm explaining really apply across the board to a whole, a whole host of um, human experiences. And then later on, I'm going to pass over to Connell, my colleague here in the UK, who works for our uh, consulting engineering team. And he's going to discuss some, something really quite different, which is about the whole um, cycle of improvement when it comes to implementing better maintenance on equipment. So that's what we're going to cover. I'm going to um, hopefully give you some sort of mathematical background to try and demystify some of the techniques we use. Um, and the techniques I'm going to explain we use in some of our software here in ABB. So I will um, 
give you a, some demonstration of some software looking at some equipment and hopefully that will reinforce some of the principles that I'll have um, I'll have presented and tried to explain in a couple of slides before we get to the demonstration. Um, and then finally, hand over to Connell. So, poll number one. Um, so, assuming it doesn't assume you're in any part of this journey that we're trying to explain over these two um, sessions of where we are on a, a journey through um, improving maintenance techniques. But if we're looking specifically at how can we detect early failure, specifically in an industrial equipment, but it could be anything. It could be your motor car, could be a washing machine, could be the economy, any system where you can, um, you know, as a, either a human or as a machine, you can understand what's going on. What is the best way? Is there a best way? Is there a combination or not? So you should have your poll up now. Um, I'm going to join in the poll, which I don't know if I have to, but I'm giving an answer. Um, and I'm just going to wait and see whether we get the results. I'm hoping that um, we're going to get the results and we'll talk through the results. Sam, if I'm not going to be able to see the results. Could you just tell me to move on? Ah, we do. Here they come. Yeah. Oh, joy. Okay. So uh i suppose we got equal between condition monitoring which was really the focus of our first discussion um last week which was centering around perhaps using clever sensors uh that can give us more insight but still at the sensing level not really looking at a machine or a system as a whole um if it, um, surprise only two people believe human intuition is important um, and I'm the only one who answered it's uh, it's simply not possible. So <laughs> I did that as just to see if anyone answered that. So um, only one person thought human intuition was um, important. That would be interesting when we get um, into a couple of slides and I go into the introduction on the data science. Um, just to reinforce this uh, overall session of two um, sessions that we start with um gain visibility of your data and understand the gap so that's to do with adding sensing so that's condition monitoring what we're now looking at is moving towards innovative techniques of analyzing data that represents health so second poll before we get into the data science um be useful for me to just understand the answers to this so the poll should be coming up now uh it's just to get a feel for the audience and how comfortable they are with mathematical techniques or statistics, whatever you call it, whatever magic um, magic words is uh, what some, pe some people call this reference to machine learning, deep learning, artificial intelligence. Some of the techniques have been around for many decades, some of them for centuries, but it's only in the recent computer age have we really been able to use some of these techniques due to the, uh, the power of computers we now have. So that's the end of the poll. Um, so no one going to PhD from MIT at the age of six. So not bad. So in the middle. So certainly I'm not talking to a mathematical illiterate audience. Uh, if It wouldn't matter if you were, because I'm going to keep it very simple, no formulae. I'm going to talk about principles that anyone with a technical background should be able to understand. So to begin with, looking at this world of statistics and data science, I'm going to just ask you to quickly look at this quote from Dr. Hannah Fry, who is a world expert in the application of machine learning and artificial intelligence. So she tends to work in the areas of behavioral systems, um, but I think this quote applies equally to our very specific world of industrial machinery, just as much as it does to some of the work that uh, Hannah Fry works on. This is from her book, Programmers Amongst You by like the title or even the diagram on the front, it's very much a computer geek title. Um, but in the chapter that I took this from, the author started to talk about how Currently, uh, cancer surgeons more and more are using artificial intelligence to assist them in their job. 
and their job of detecting, diagnosing and removing tumours and then treating the, uh, the patients after the tumour removal. So something we're all very aware of and have touched most of, most of our lives, I'm sure. Um, so that's here and now. Uh, surgeons throughout the world trust and medical professionals trust uh, computerized expert systems and artificial intelligence to assist them in their jobs. Um, and then this chapter went on to describe the, the massive challenges facing the holy grail of the driverless car. So autonomous vehicles are with us in some cities in a very limited uh, stage at the moment. Uh, it's been talked about for at least the last 20 years and a lot of work has and is going on and most uh, people in the field believe that within 10 years we will have driverless cars as a norm on everyday roads throughout the world. So there's two things either side in this chapter of our looking at uh, industrial machinery that are stressing these two points here. Number one, humans don't you know? Don't worry, we're not going to be replaced by computers anytime soon. We're very good at some things that computers now maybe never will be able to do. Um, we just an amazing amount of data in our billions of neurons. The, even the world's amazing supercomputers, and even if we do get quantum computers, probably will never replace a biological organism. So don't worry, they're not making us all redundant. However, we're also really, really bad at things. Uh, luckily, computers tend to be very good at the things we're very bad at. So why wouldn't you use a combination of the two? So I go back to my poll question and the first poll question. So looking at what we just saw as a quote in the context of this, the answer really should be it's probably a combination because you want to use human expertise, what it's good at, and then you want to combine that with um, what computers are good at. So hopefully I'm going to show you some examples um, and explain how we can realize that um, using real software applied to uh, real situations. OK, so. Let's uh, zoom in on one of these. What we're looking at here is a traditional way of just using human knowledge and experience to understand things. So to understand things, we need to perceive them. So whether we hear them, smell them, feel them, hear them, that's how we perceive things and make judgments. So for our machine analysis systems, um, we tend to be looking at variables. Commonly in equipment condition monitoring, we look at vibrations, we look at temperatures, we look at a whole range of process measurements, such as the output from analyzers, um, flows, pressures, etc. So if I gave someone this um, plot here on the left, very easy to understand. Now, that's because I can visualize it. And it's clear, the pattern is absolutely clear. So the blue line shows some sort of characteristic. That could be a time trend, like the uh, the stock market, although I think it'd probably be in reverse if it was the stock market right now. Um, time to buy shares, everyone. Or it could be an XY plot, a scatter plot. It could be looking at the correlation between two different measurements, so pressure or temperature. Um, but very quickly, you can see the trend and you can draw a straight line through it. However, what we're interested in in the innovative techniques is let's we need to look at more and more signals and the combinations of those signals and how they vary over time and how they vary in other dimensions. So as humans, we can certainly. Um, so there's a question just come. I'm definitely sharing the screen, I think. Um, the second one shows a slightly more complicated plot. It's a surface plot. So it's in three dimensions. Now, as humans, that's fine. We can understand that because you know we are made, and nature has made us to understand three dimension, dimensions in our spatial awareness using our eyes. We can see the valleys. We can see the mountain tops. We can understand the gradients between them. So far, so good. So I'm now looking at three dimensional data. So you know, for our machine example, I might be looking at a temperature, a vibration and a power output. 
What happens if I start adding more things? Because the real world is complex. The real world consists of many dozens, hundreds, thousands of measurements. I mean, if you're looking at an oil refinery, you could be looking at up to 200,000 signals on a large integrated site. So that's massive. So a human could never look at all that data in any dimension, even if you're just looking at single variables, looking in the time dimension, you would be overwhelmed by that data. Not only as a human would we not be able to see the the underlying characteristics and nuances and relationships and things are changing, we get bored. And it's just a characteristic of humans that within, um, so educational research shows that within 20 minutes, most people have lost half of their ability to concentrate. And interestingly, I've just looked, I've been speaking for 16 minutes, speaking in a, in a way as teachers we call transmission teaching, it's the worst me talking at you in this remote world i can't even see you it's dreadful i can't see who's asleep out there i can't even see if anyone is out there so the point is humans get bored easily and also we can't really cope with anything more than three or four dimensions so how could we understand the interactions and subtleties between many dozens or hundreds of variables we can't so we have to use a computer so <laughs> This is an attempt at visualizing it. It looks more like chaos to me than, uh, than an ordered system, but he's trying to represent a multi-dimensional space. So just looking at a complex machine like a gas turbine, we may have 3,000, 5,000 sensors on that one machine. To understand what's happening in that machine, we really need to be able to get into those signals and see how they all relate to each other. But we haven't done that generally up till now. Most traditional systems, such as a car engine management system, will just look at signals on their own. It's got a univariate system. They do not look at combinations of signals. So we set things called alarms on thresholds. <clears throat> Some systems have what's called intelligent alarming. We change the threshold based on what's happening. But it's still a very blunt tool. Um, and it certainly does not pick up a lot of the nuances and um, behaviors we're interested in and that we know are in there. As soon as something starts changing, whether it's a tiny change on a journal bearing as it's picking up a bit of um, metal and starting to degrade many weeks or months before it fails. Maybe we're looking at the fouling on a heat exchanger or a wear on a bearing. It doesn't matter. We, there will be signatures in the data if you collect the right data and you look at it in the right way. So I, I chose this low oil pressure example because I remember when, when I was young, I worked as a car mechanic and I was in a car with four other lads and we were driving down the highway. And we had heard a couple of days before a slight ticking and two of us were mechanics. We knew what it was. It was the journal bearings in the big end and the crankshaft was picking up but we'd ignored it. The end of the story is, in fact, a fire. The car caught fire at 70 miles an hour. We stopped. Luckily, the fire service turned up and put the fire out, destroyed the car. The point of the story was the oil pressure light came on about 10 seconds before that big end bearing seized and threw the big end through the crankcase. So uh, just normal alarming systems looking at a single variable against a single threshold, in my experience, aren't as good as we can do. So how can we improve this? So I'm going to start with the premise that to understand ill health, which is what we're looking at, we're looking at asset health, we're looking at failures or faults. So very much analogous to human health here. So if you go to a doctor and say, doctor, doctor, it sounds like a joke. Doctor, doctor, I'm not feeling very well. The first thing they'll probably say is, um, well, you know, what's wrong? How, what, why do you feel bad? And if you said, well, I don't feel bad, they'd say, well, you're not ill, are you? Because you feel OK. And that's really the premise behind the approach I'm going to show you. It's the fact that if you characterize good health, you've got a very, very good basis for understanding ill health. It almost sounds like a philosophical point, but a lot of software that looks for failures tries to understand failures. Now, 
your failure detection, if it's based on what a failure looks like, is only as good as the next failure that you don't understand. So if you have a model that models things and then another failure comes along, unless you model it, you don't know that that train is just about to come off the rails. Whereas if you model good health, any deviation from good health should raise indications that perhaps something's going on. So based on that, let's look at how we can model good health. Now, I've already described that if we're looking at many dozens or hundreds of variables, that's our dimension in a mathematical sense. That's our dimensionality. We're not just looking at X and Y. We're not looking at two or X, Y and Z or X, Y, Z or Z, or I'd say, and the time dimension. As humans, we can just about cope with four dimensions. Let's say we've got 20 dimensions. We're looking at a, um, a reasonably simple piece of equipment, but we think we've got 20 measurements that give us some indication of um, the health of that system, condition monitoring in effect. So each of these colored dots here represents those 12 signals, say. So although I can only show it to you in two dimensions, computers are great. Computers aren't bound by two, three, four, or any finite number of dimensions. Depending on the computing power you've got, the mathematics exists to look at any space in dimensions. And that's very difficult to understand, but it's true. So we just have to believe it. And we go back to our analogies of two or three dimensions and say, yeah, OK, I can draw a, a, a straight line through a cloud of dots in three dimensions. Therefore, why shouldn't I be able to in four dimensions? And computers can. So all of these dots represent an operating point in my machine. So if you counted all the dots and you said there were 10,000 dots there, maybe those 10,000 dots were the 10,000 measurements I took for the last 10,000 seconds or minutes or hours. And each one had 12 numbers associated with it. Temperatures, pressures, vibrations, concentrations, power derived things like efficiency. OK, so now we understand that. The first thing we want to do is identify where the, the, the data is clustered. So clustering is just a region. And this is where we start talking about the, uh, the that term machine learning. So in machine learning, we talk about two types of machine learning, one called supervised and one called unsupervised. Supervised learning is things like Alexa and her neural networks, where Alexa learns words and in her computerized way understands the meaning of those words. This is an example of what's called unsupervised learning. All we're looking for is features or patterns. Um, how it it's it's used quite a lot so for example facial recognition when you go through a biometric scanner at an airport that's using unsupervised learning it's recognizing features in your face that it can cluster around and then it just has a single dichotomous decision is it you or isn't it how good is the fit of the data it sees with the fit of the data it has learned so in a similar way instead of modeling someone's face we're modeling our machine in good health now, looking at the title of this, I've used the idiom of finding a needle in a haystack. Now, the point of a needle in a haystack is there's one needle in a, in a massive haystack. Now, there's a lot of hay in there that's pretty useless. I'm looking for the needle. The more I can remove all that hay and get down to just perhaps a few strands of hay in the needle, I haven't lost the needle at all. The needle is in there. So the trick is to get rid of everything that surrounds the thing I'm looking for. Why that's important for us is what we're trying to do is compare what we feel like now, think of the medical analogy, with what good health looks like. So <clears throat> I, um, by compressing this data, as long as I compress it and maintain the essence of that data, that's what I'm looking for. The smaller I can make my data set, the easier it is for me to search, find and compare. And that's what I'm trying to do here. So that's why I've said less is more. The more I can compress without losing the meaning of the data, the better. And there's a very easy example. And the example is called an MP4 file. Sure, we all agree video or audio compression is great because we hear something or see something that looks just like the original, but it's a lot quicker to download or stick on a pen drive or whatever. Um, 
that's the same technique as we're doing here. We're compressing data and it's called lossy compression. We are losing some of the fidelity of the data, but we're retaining enough of the meaning of the data for it to be useful. So, you know, that Beethoven sounds like Beethoven, not perfect, but it's good enough for what I want. And for my equipment model, I want the data compressed in a way that I can still recognize good, um, uh, good health and be able to compare what I'm currently at and see how far away from it I am. So I've got some terms on the right here. They're just some of the mathematical techniques and terminology that are associated with this idea of, first of all, identifying clusters in a, an unsupervised feature space. And then by compressing that data, first of all, by random sampling, and then finally using um, a technique called principal components analysis, we managed to compress the data just like a, an MP4 file, way, way down, you know, a hundred thousand times sometimes. And you'd be amazed, it's still pretty, the data is still fit for purpose. And then finally, what I want to do is compare where I am now. So my current, my real time temperatures, pressures, and vibrations, how are they varying against the values that are similar to the position they are in the model? And the position of these colors, the clusters represent operating conditions. So for instance, if this was modeling a car engine, it might be that uh, one section was the, the car was running um, along a motorway. The other one was it was dropping the kids off at school. Um, another one is it shows it accelerating hard. The other one is it's going downhill and it's freewheeling. So it copes with all these things, this modeling technique. It copes with the concept of non-linearization, missing data, sparse data. All of these problems we get in data analysis, this technique is very robust in handling these. Some of the techniques we traditionally use in condition monitoring are not so robust. They require defined mathematical formulae that relate to how things relate together. They're not robust against uh, nonlinear data. So it's a pretty good way of um, modeling Ill, uh, good health and then comparing current against it, against it. So, so far I've talked about the data science. I'm just going to finish off by quickly going almost to the start of the story, which is I've talked a lot about, yeah, fine, I can represent good health and a perfect machine, if you like. It's like the golden batch in a way. You know, you, you maintain a machine and you characterize it, you fingerprint it. That shows how it should be running. Well, how do I turn that into understanding failures or early detection of failure? And then furthermore, how do I then turn that into ac actions and recommendations? Well, here I fall back on um, just uh, standard reliability engineering practice uh, technique that's been around for decades called failure mode analysis. Uh, quite straightforward. What it does is it's uh, it's called a functional um, approach. We look at the function of a machine, what it does, and then we break it down of how it does it. Um, but finally, we find that um, we have for each of our functions we have a way it can fail, our failure mode. So this is an example. It's not a very well written example, but it's a reasonable example of a simple pump. And it's identified four functions. And therefore, each of those functions can have one or more than one failure mode. But for each failure mode, we have the ability to detect, or rather, as long as we can detect it, then as long as we can measure it, which hopefully detection generally, we now have sensors and transducers of all sorts that we can detect all sorts of things in machinery. Those, by detecting deviation against the norm for all of these measurements, allows us to make a correlation between what the measurements are telling me and the failure mode. So we now go into the world of probability. So depending on the size and the type of our deviation from what good health looks like as seen in the measurements allows us to give a quantitative so not the qualitative word type model here but an, a numbers based model that gives indication and can link that indication to failure modes and of course failure modes then we can give recommended actions so we give a time dimension and an action so before I show you the software, I'll just take you through how the software 
applies the principles I've just described. So on the screen here, you can see a, um, a hydro turbine, a beautiful 1950s design here. Um, this is the generator top on the, on the top of the, the turbine. Uh, underneath it is a hydro turbine, which uses the power of water to spin a shaft and generate electricity. So we've applied this software in the hydro turbine industry and the, it's a good example of uh, a multidisciplinary model because a, a hydro turbine plant, the equipment has hydrodynamics, has hydrostatics, it has mechanical engineering in terms of the dynamics of the moving machinery as well as the static stresses throughout the structure. Um, very much so these machines are massive so vibration analysis and acoustic analysis gives us indication of health um, it then turns into the electrical world so we have electrical equipment so we can look at electrical signals we can look at voltage residual currents power factors so it's a measurement rich system um, that if you say writing down the physical models the mathematical equations that link all these together it's very complex whereas the data science approach, we say, well, we don't need to. We just look at what healthy looks like. We fingerprint the healthy signals, and then we compare for the rest of time how we're comparing against that. And that's what this um, part of the diagram shows. It shows my compressed healthy model. I compare my current operating point with the model. And this is where I use my, my search functions. I use my clever... Uh, Euclidean distance and minimizing errors to, to come up with um, a point that gives me a reference condition for all of those values. So for how the machine is operating now, which I've worked out by searching the model, looking at the cluster, I then, for each of the measurements within that measurement set, I then compare how close they are to the reference value from the model. So it all comes back to the model. There is no configuration of this. It uses unsupervised machine learning to build my model. So, so far, I haven't told, you know, this story is all about the mathematics. Um, so we produce a, a univariate indication per signal, which is how close is that signal to the value I would expect for where the machine is running now. And I'll show you that in the software. It makes a lot more sense in the demo. Now I bring in the human expertise. Our fault model is just part of the FMEA I just showed you. All it is is a weighted matrix that relates failure modes to measurements. It's basically saying that, I don't know. So um, a problem with a shaft, a shaft imbalance is very much recognized through the vibrations on either end of that shaft. So my, my model would correlate shaft imbalance problems with vibration. So as far as soon as the vibration starts exceeding and go, moving away from its reference point and growing, I know that there's a potential signature there that relates to shaft imbalance as a potential problem. Of course, there may be other problems that will cause the, 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 some of these signals to also deviate, and that's beautifully handled by this because I can build as many models as I like. I just partition my models by the signals I've got. I can use the signals in more than one model, and therefore I can compare different models, but I'm not comparing them mathematically. I'm comparing them using the fault model. So I'm using the engineer's terminology. I'm using terms like uh, leakage and um, degradation, all the things I can relate to the physical world. So I've de-abstracted, I was gonna say de-abstracted, <laughs> I've taken away the hidden numbers from data science and I've given it meaning using my engineering model. So based on that, I can now give fault indications. So the KDI relates to measurements and a univariate, you know, that's that temperature moving away, that's that vibration moving. Whereas the faults relate to the faults, they relate to the imbalance, to the corrosion, um, to the uh, breakdown of some insulation on some electrical cabling, whatever the fault is, and some loosening in a, a mechanical coupling, I now have numerous, uh, a numerous uh, quantitative number that gives me an indication of how well or how poorly my machine is performing. And because I now have these 
indicators, uh, I can apply standard prediction algorithms to try and predict the future. Now, of course, anyone who tells you they can predict the future are lying and you should not trust them. No one can predict the future. But we make a good old guess at it every time we do a weather forecast or we give uh, a forecast on how well a football team is going to do because we use past performance. And we use past performance allied with knowledge of the system. So if, you, if we think there's periodic or seasonal variation within our system, we make sure that our forecast algorithms are cognizant of that and include it in our forecast or prediction. Okay, so that's the theory. Uh, here's the software. So uh, the software is an enterprise level type software. So I can start at the top level of a, a power station fleet and I go down through individual plants, down through units, units a collection of associated equipment. And finally, I get to where I'm doing all the clever calculations analysis. Um, I get down to the individual pieces of equipment or to, you can decide what an equipment is, of course. It's up to you to decide on the system boundaries. Um, so for my heat exchanger here, I have the two indicators here, the health indicator and the failure indicator, which is what I've shown here. So absolutely as shown here, flow from left to right. I have health indicators for measurements and I have fault indicators for faults. So if I just hover over here, we can see that in my very simple heat exchanger model I've just built, this isn't on a real plant, this is on a simulator, I have um, uh, heat exchanger temperatures on my cold and hot side in and out and I um, monitor the the valve position in fact here's all the variables down here so very simple model I've just got six signals but there's still a lot of data <laughs> you get out of a heat exchanger model just looking at your temperatures both on the shell and the tube side and looking at what your control valve is doing on the controlled stream so that's in effect what I'm doing here. I'm looking at the valves and I'm looking at the temperatures. This here shows me how in order of badness. So in a way, that's uh, top is not the right word. It's actually worse health indicators. So zero is terrible. My simulator, I've given it data that is a signal that is so far away from its reference point. Uh, I'd be surprised if this machine hadn't failed. Um, and then for my faults here, I have... Um, fouling on both sides of my exchanger and i've also modeled a problem with a, uh, the control valve so if i click on this this is where you can see the failure model so the failure model uh, which we indicated here because that's how we're comparing the failure model against each of the measurements the failure model um, is based on it relates the failure to the measurements. So the failure here is fouling on the cold side, one thing. Um, and very simply, I've modeled it just with two measurements, the cooling fluid flow and the cooling fluid outlet temperature. Okay, so I'm looking on the probably on the shell side of my exchanger. So I have the indicator value. So this is uh, a normalized number between zero and 100%, 100% is if it's on the reference point, it can go over 110, uh, sorry, it can go over 100% <clears throat> if I've characterized my measurement as if it goes one side or other of the reference, it might actually show it's even healthier. So let's say I, I human health terms, I take my blood pressure when I'm feeling pretty healthy and I say that that is my reference point. Now, if I manage to get my blood pressure down to 115 over 60 that's better than my average believe me um so it's actually better so what's better than 100 percent? so we do allow uh, the percentage to rise above 100 slightly for for measurements we've characterized as um being healthy or one side or other of the reference um uh, so for example a vibration would be the other way that you know the higher the vibration the less healthy it is as well availability would be the lower the reference the healthier so the PV value, ah, now this is in engineering units. So that's in liters per second or whatever. And this would be in degrees uh, centigrade or uh, degrees Fahrenheit, depending where you are in the world. And the reference is the value I expect. 
So this is where you can see cooling fluid flow is down at 26 liters per second. My model has told me it should be 233. It's terrible. I mean, that, that exchanger is so clogged up. I'd imagine there's probably quite a few um, living things that have got in there. It's probably sucked something up through some seawater or something. So that's why that 0% is dreadful. Whereas the cooling fluid outlet is really healthy because my reference is below the current value. And then in all these statistical analysis, uh, you know, one of the things we really always like to know when we have we're looking at um, representative data is what our standard deviation is. So this is a normalized standard deviation, once again, derived from the model. Everything is just about derived from the data model, apart from the structure of the failure model. So just to show you, uh, sorry, just to show the sorts of things that we characterize um, failures by, I said that once we have an indication of both how severe is the problem if we are seeing a problem and secondly how probable is that that problem is developing we use two different algorithms based the best example of explaining the, the difference between these are if we if we look at somebody now who a doctor suspects of covid 19 infection if someone has a very high temperature they and that if they had COVID-19, that would be very severe. But they might not have it because, in fact, they have their sense of smell. They don't have the fever. They don't have the aches. So maybe they don't have COVID-19. So severity looks at the magnitude of deviation amongst the variables, whereas the probability looks that you have most of the features you would expect in the variables. And we used we used different mathematical averaging techniques to give us um, representative indices that give some indication of these two um, aspects of the the failure of the early failure because we're talking about early failure detection this thing hasn't failed it's still working hopefully um, so just to make that actionable we describe um, uh, it's, there's not much here but uh, for an operator who wasn't an expert in heat exchangers it might explain what's happening and then it would give the maintenance guys a recommendation or it might raise a, a signal signal into a, a maintenance system that raises a work order all that that normal integration type stuff um so that's the failure side just to finish off on the um measurement side um we can uh, yeah standard trending panning zooming looking at both the the indicators and the values so this is the engineering unit stuff temperatures and pressures um, whereas this is looking at our our standardized percentage indicator of how healthy and on the right you can see it's prediction so i'm flatlining in this simulator in fact the simulator is turned off probably um, and that's why we're getting um, just flatline predictions there so from my perspective i think i'm nearly done and i do thank you if any of you are still awake well done i don't have any difficult maths questions um to see if, how many people are awake i guess we could try this it's the last poll question uh for my subject um so can we have the poll now please um, So it's really just so I can tell um, how many people on the call do a certain job. And please be honest here. I mean, I'll be honest. I definitely do not do this as a day job. I'm a, I'm a systems engineer. I'm a mechanical engineer, I'm an electrical engineer, and a chemical engineer by profession. But none of these are part of my day job. Um, so I think I'm amongst friends <laughs> looking at those numbers there. So thank you very much. Um, yeah, that doesn't surprise me that Viable is really low down the list. Um, that's good. One of you's done it. Uh, for those who don't know what Viable analysis is, it's it's a mathematical analysis of um, failure. So it's um, yeah, used commonly in things like the nuclear industry and the uh, aerospace industry, where we really try and build very accurate physical models, or, yeah, statistical models of the failure of components. 
Okay, so I'm going to hand over to Connell now, my colleague, who's going to uh, just review, recap very quickly this and explain a case study. So uh, thank you very much for listening, and I'll hand over to Connell. Hello, can you hear me? I can. We can hear you. Okay, great. You see my... Yes. Slide. Great. Go in and present. Yep, there you go. So, um, yes, yeah, so Peter left off um, talking about gaining visibility of your data and analyzing, understanding some trends, um, key trends towards faults, and using those to predict faults before they happen and optimize the maintenance strategy. Um, and then what I'm talking to about to you all about is the is the um, step six in this process, um, which is establishing a reliability culture. Now, you could argue that this could be step one in the process. Um, these things go around in cycles. You um, do some work with reliability. Um, you then get some data, and then that allows you to develop your reliability culture further. And so I'll start just by talking about what we mean by reliability culture. So a reliability culture is one where everybody at all levels is continuously involved in the identification, understanding, and application of appropriate reliability behaviors and practices throughout an asset's life cycle. And the best parallel to this is a safety culture in, in most industrial organizations. Um, a lot of time, effort, and resources are put into developing and maintaining a safety culture. And safety is the number one priority on so many um, industrial sites that you go to. And we're trying to get that same commitment to reliability culture that people really make it their own business to um, to help the plant become more reliable. It's not somebody else's job. If they see something that's wrong, they don't walk past it. They take action and own the problem until it gets solved. Talk about a case study of um, an oil refinery in um, the UK on a place called Grangemouth. Um, this is a company that was established as a, as a joint venture um, between Ineos, uh, um, British-based chemical company, and PetroChina, a Chinese petrochemical company. And they bought this refinery that was an, an old refinery from, from BP. Um, and really, the, the, the refinery was, was not doing too well in its industry benchmark. So they demanded from the organization to improve its own performance, improve the, the, the performance indicators across the, the operation. And one area, key area was um, availability, improve reliability, improve availability. And then the joint venture would um, unlock capital investment once the site had, had, had developed the capability and demonstrated the fact that it could um, improve often briefly from its own efforts. So uh, there was a lot of um, overcapacity in the UK refining market. Twenty several refineries had closed, and it was a case of which refinery is next. Real driving force to improve. There were new owners. There was. Um, a lot of cost pressure in the market. So this this need to improve reliability, to get the availability that the plant needed to become um, sufficiently profitable was 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 key. So this this initiative um, was, was launched by Petronios and ABB were brought in to support it with some uh, workshops and strategy development, full management team engagement. Um, and then we re identified the need for a reliability steering team, so for some governance of this reliability initiative. And then together with that steering team, we developed cohesive vision and strategy, and then a roadmap to improve a, a step change in reliability. And you can see from the pictures, a lot of these tools were decidedly low technology, um, but flip charts and post-it notes do work well. Um, and then that had the, the, the general things you'd find in the program, some activities, and their impact on the vision, milestones, and time scales. And then we define some um, streams with roles, responsibilities, and then develop three improvement teams. We looked at implementing root cause analysis um, across the site, 
And then a team looking at, at train wrecks. These were big failures with high consequences on production that took a long time to fix and were very expensive to fix. And then a vulnerability process. So this is starting to look at some of the things that Peter's talking about, doing um, analyses to find potential failures before they occurred so that rather than being one step behind failures, you're one step ahead of them. Several um, improvement initiatives such as Away days where we took people off um, from different departments, brought them together, ran some fun events with um, workshops and activities, a little bit different from the daily routine. Um, the management team were there, and then we ran another event like that a couple of years later. Also, these much more focused improvement teams, which are small working groups that were then um, tasked with, with, with enact an improvement day to day on the site. And then as, as, as these teams have success and solve the initial problems, then the intention was to roll out more and more teams as time goes on. And then since these, these 2017 reliability away days, uh, ABB has been involved in some uh, reliability conversations are called. So one-to-one -one conversations with, with key people from the site to allow them just to, to share their thoughts and experiences of, of, of the reliability journey, um, the frustrations and, and and what they've achieved, and then we fed that back to the to the steering committee, and they've got they've taken a pulse then of the organisation, um, and 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 could use some um, um, initiatives to to act on that that feedback that they're getting. And the consequence of this is that um, the Graysmouth site, which includes the the refinery plus another um, set of, of 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 downstream petrochemical facilities, they got investment for a uh, $350 million new power plant. So the, the reliability um, had improved and they managed to unlock this, this investment and get the commitment to, to long-term capital investment to the site. So um, it just goes to show that you can develop. Yeah. Um, it's not quick. This started in, in 2016 and that investment decision was made in 2019. And the speed that you can um enact that change is going to depend on many factors um what's the sense of of urgency um uh, company survival will focus the mind the existing culture and history and and the baggage that goes with that um the senior management team commitment and, and involvement and energy is going to be a big factor and then also the somewhat commitment to support for change um and we've got these eight um eight phases to to create the conditions for change, introducing new practices and then ma maintaining the momentum. So that is our, our model for developing a reliability culture. Um, and and it is having it has having effect. You can see that the, the, the companies that we visit are getting better at this. Um, we've... Poll question. Um, so what progress has your organization made towards developing a reliability culture? Have you not started? Are you creating the conditions for change? Are you introducing new practices? Or have you reached a phase where you, you've achieved it and you're maintaining the momentum? Right. Okay. So that looks like the um, majority of, or the most most popular is creating the conditions for change. So it's good that that the majority of people have started and are, are on the journey. Um, but it shows that there's still there's still quite a long way to go um, for the majority of industry to to maintain, be at the phase where they're maintaining their reliability culture. So thank you for that. Um, and and the last poll. So based on what you've heard today, do you think it's clear which is the best strategy to improve asset performance and achieve excellence? So is it condition-based monitoring, predictive analytics, reliability-centered maintenance programs, a combination of two of more of the above, or is it not clear?
Great. So I think um, seventy-nine percent have said a combination of two of more of the above, and I think we'd agree with that. So that's fantastic. Um, so that's everything from me. I think I just Sam, uh, so she can chair the the Q and A in the time that we have left. Thank you. Thank you, Connell, and thank you, Peter. Um, yeah, we're going to take a few minutes for questions.